Excellent. So yeah, uh, as introduced by David then, so I'm going to talk about uh, MTC's activities within a maze, uh, looking at feedstock control. I unfortunately don't have the luxury like Dave of saying these aren't my slides. So <laughs> if these go badly, these are my fault. <laughs> so excellent. Contents of the slide then. So just to put it into context, uh, at the start, I just want to talk a little bit about what feedstocks in AM look like. So the different variants of feedstock that you can use within the AM process. Um, talk a bit about specifically the powder feedstock for AM. Um, so looking at what we can measure with powder, what we need to control, why that's important. And then move on to some of the case studies that we've done. So looking at the wider work that we did around um, trying to assess the European supply for uh, powders for AM, uh, and then apply that to a specific case study on titanium 64. So, just show how we've applied our methodology that we developed and aspects, how we applied that to powders that we receive from the supply chain, and how we assess and validate them for quality, and how we then use that to inform the materials that would be used to make the APODs that David discussed in the previous uh, presentations. So, <clears throat> as David said, AM is not about taking a big uh, solid metal, you know, piece of metal and then machining that down. Uh, it requires a different type of feedstock. Generally speaking, there are two main entrants, shall we say, for feedstock into AM. One is powder, which is probably the workhorse of the AM industries. Uh, the other being wire. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm only really going to focus on and discuss um, powder AM. Wire was covered within the wider scope of, of um, the AMH project but was not in the area that I was working. So for anyone looking into wire, this is perhaps not the presentation for you. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot more interesting, a lot more difficult challenges, shall we say, when it comes to the powder side of things. So what was, the, what was our sort of remit? So bear in mind, this project started, I think, as David said, five years ago. So around the time I was starting it, at the MTC, there wasn't really a well-defined process for how we characterize and accept or even understand metal powders for additive manufacturing. So when I first started at the MTC, I had actually a bit of a knowledge transfer from the pharmaceutical industry. So I had had quite a wide experience of how powders had been controlled and, and characterized and, and attempted to understand. So when I first started at the MTC, for me, it was around transferring that knowledge of how we characterize powders in the pharmaceutical industry and how that could be applied to the AM industry. So people like David were there to teach me AM and metal. I was there to teach them how to test powders. Uh, and that was primarily where the, we started to define what actually we want to measure about the powders. Uh, as I mentioned, we did a pretty wide-reaching assessment of the European supply chain. Uh, so we looked at numerous suppliers of metal powders only within the European scene. Um, and try to understand just how much they vary from supplier to supplier. You know, some were different manufacturing techniques, some were the same techniques. It's just interesting to see how much they vary and how those varying properties affect the way in which the powder performs. Based on that, we developed some specifications around what we actually wanted from the powder in terms of what we wanted it to do. Uh, and then from that, we did a down selection on those suppliers uh, for various different materials with various different um, AM processes. And then effectively, that's, that was then set in stone, and all materials that came into the Amaze program to make APODs were assessed based on that qualification process we developed. Oh, so we did say the APODs mean demonstration part. <laughs> so why do we care so much about powder then? So there are commercial reasons why we care, and there are technical reasons as well. So if we consider titanium-64 uh, manufactured using the electron beam process, to start with, you would need 200 kilograms of powder to fill the build chamber, to do a full height build. Um, based on the current cost of, of um, titanium powder, the production cost of it is, it's a bit, it makes about a third of the cost of the production powder. You know, so it's not a small commodity, it is expensive. And because it's so expensive, we need to be able to reuse it. So David mentioned that um, the thing with AM is it's material sparing. But the issue is, if you can't take your 200 kilograms of powder that you've just used to make a part that was 20 kilograms, it's not very material sparing. It's damn expensive powder to throw away. So we need to make sure that to make the business case work, we can reuse material. 
The other thing is we need to validate supply chain. That's obviously what this work was about. One of the examples I always like to highlight um, when I'm talking about this is one of the suppliers of AM machines, I won't mention who, supplied header into MTC, uh, and then partway through you know, quite a large build campaign, we, we ordered some new batches of material, and suddenly it looked a little bit different. It behaved a little bit different. It turned out that the supplier had changed the material supply on us. So they'd suddenly gone to a different supplier, a different technology to get their powders. Clearly, when we're trying to make this an industrial process, that's not a, a good place for us to be. We need to be able to make sure that we know what the supply chain is for our materials. We need that sort of traceability and that confidence that the supply chain isn't going to change. Technically, we ask, the powder, we ask a lot of the powder. We, we, we need to spread potentially up to tens of thousands of layers. That gives us tens of thousands of chances to get it wrong. So if the powder doesn't behave consistently and spread consistently, Effectively, you, you might end up with prosty in your spread powder layer, uh, which effectively will result in defects, potentially. We, because you need to be able to recycle it, we have to be able to manage that. So we have to understand if I use the material once, twice, ten times, how has it changed? Is that going to affect the process? And ultimately, quality of the powder will, will directly impact quality of the part. So if you just think very top level, any process is made of what you put into it and what you're doing to it, and that's going to affect your component properties. If we don't know what we're putting into it, and, and again, coming back to the highlight of where our supplier changed our material on us, if we don't know what we're putting in and we run a fixed process window, then we can never truly control component properties. But if we have a material that complies with an adequate specification, we know what we need it to look like, and we might measure that it looks like that, then you know, we can run that fixed process window and fix product properties. So what do we want paired to do in AM then? So really sort of brief schematic diagram of what an AM machine looks like, but firstly we want to store powder. So when we're storing the material, we care about the bulk density because that's ultimately going to affect how much material we can actually put into the machine in the first place. Some machines aren't designed to hold enough powder to complete a build, so bulk density is quite a critical aspect here. Moisture content because it will affect potentially oxide formation on the material, it will affect it, how it flows, and we care about particle size distribution because size distribution is uh, quite a critical as aspect for AM powders. Then we want to dose the powder. So at some stage, we want to get the powder out of its stored state into a machine. When we're dosing powder, we really want a precise dose of material so we get the same every time, so we know that we have enough material to spread. In that case, what we're interested in is flow. Is the powder going to bridge in my hopper, or is it, gonna, is it going to uh, dose consistently? We care about size distribution. Has it segregated during storage, for instance? Then we want to spread that powder. So we've now dosed it in front of a spreading uh, arm, for instance. We now want to spread it across the build chamber. So now we care about how will it flow, how will it pack, uh, what's its moisture content, for instance. Again, that's going to affect how it's going to flow. And then we want to actually melt the powder once we've spread it. In this case, we're interested in chemistry. Is it the right chemistry? Does it have high interstitial content? Is it clean? Has it got any foreign particulates in there that are going to have an impact on the performance of the part? Do I have any porosity in my particles that potentially might build defects? Uh, and bulk density, do I have a consistent bulk density and will I get consistent melting across the whole area? So there's a lot of things there that we want to measure and there's a lot of things going on, so how can we start to measure that? In the MTC we basically say there's four things that we try to measure, particulate properties, bulk properties, chemistry and cleanliness. So in particular what we're interested in is the size and shape of the material, so its distribution. Um, its morphology, Do, is it spherical, is it, is it irregular? It's porosity, does it have any porosity in there that, you know, porosity that's sealed inside the particles that have resulted from the atomization process? Why we care about these particular properties is because they're going to start to have an effect on the way the pair behaves as a bulk, so it's going to start to affect the way it packs and the way it flows. Chemistry, clearly we're never going to choose a material based on how it flows or its size distribution, or what we care about at the end of the day is, is the chemistry right for the part. So here we're interested in bulk alloying elements. Is it in the correct specification? Interstitials, does it have high levels of oxygen, for instance, if it's titanium? Cleanliness, somewhat more difficult to quantify, but what we're interested in when it comes to cleanliness is do we have any foreign particulates in the material which are going to have an impact? So there's certain supplies of titanium, for instance, which have uh, high levels of tungsten in them. Well, not high levels, but they have occurrences of tungsten in them. Those are the kind of things that we're interested in. 
very difficult to measure. So if we look at the supply chain assessment then, what did we do? For the purposes of a maze, we were interested in um, three technologies. So that's electron beam melting, or EBM, paired bed fusion, PBF, and blown powder. Chemistry-wise, we were interested in three chemistries, titanium-64, inknel 718 and aluminium-10, silica, magnesium. What we effectively did, we went to the supply chain and we tried to find, within Europe, who makes these powders, um, what size fractions they were able to provide us with, what atomizing route they used to make the powder, and effectively we ordered batches from each of these suppliers, got them into the MTC, tested them using the, the techniques I discussed earlier. So what were we looking for when we were testing these, these materials, specifically from a spec point of view? Conformance to chemistry was obviously a major one for us. Is it the right alloy composition? Does it have the right level of interstitials? Does it have the correct size distribution? Now, what's correct size distribution mean? So for paired bed fusion, we were looking for 15 to 45 microns. So how close is the yield that they provide us with in that size fraction? For electron beam, we're interested in 45 to 106 microns. Blown powder, we're interested in the 45 to 90. So we're making an assessment as to how good the suppliers are at providing us with powders in these size fractions. Flow properties, we measured using you know, traditional techniques such as Hall's flow, but also using more advanced techniques um, used in the pharmaceutical industry such as the Freeman FT4. What we're interested in is do we have a material that will effectively do all the things I said earlier, dose consistently, spread evenly. The better, the better the flow, we assume, the better the process. Maintain consistent bulk density, so again, we wanted to measure density. Generally speaking, higher packing density was preferable, and that's what we were looking for. Spherical morphology was a big key for us. Obviously, this is one of the biggest things that drives flow, drives packing. The more spherical, the better, the, the better these will be. Um, and then the other thing was around affordability. So is the material cost effective? Are we paying a premium to get what we want? And then fundamental, ultimately, will the supplier be able to consistently meet that spec once they've made it? So atomization. So shown here is just an example of gas atomization. What is it? It's effectively the process of um, creating surface area on a fundamental level. And what that means is that you, you need a lot of energy to create that surface area. So the first way you do it is melting it. So you put in a lot of energy to melt the material. You then, um, the second level of energy is high argon or nitrogen gas, for instance, to basically break up a molten stream of, of, of molten liquid metal and basically break that up into droplets, which then solidify and turn into uh, you know, metal particles. There are other ways of doing it. There are lots of ways of doing it. There's, for instance, water atomization, plasma atomization, um, plasma rotating electrode process, all similar in the sense that they're atomization, they use high pressured uh, gas to make particles, and then you've got me uh, mechanical methods such as hydride dehydride and spheroidization. If you look at the way that those uh, processes, you know, the typical properties of powders that those processes make, we can immediately say for the purposes of AM, water atomization and hydride dehydride is not a suitable technique. Morphology is just not right, we don't get the flow, we don't get the packing properties. From a cost perspective, um, we find that spheroidized hydride hydride, which is a treatment you can do on, high, on the sort of more mechanically milled HDH powders, cost-wise is just not suitable. It's too expensive compared to the rest. So it leaves us with three sort of techniques of interest, plasma, prep, and gas. The issue with some of these is for titanium, this is, this is quite good, but for uh, things like the nickels and the aluminiums, not the plasma and the prep aren't necessarily the uh, best ways to make those. It's not always possible, so you'd probably have to move to straight to gas. So straight away, before we even start to look at materials, we're trying to just understand what can we eliminate immediately. So when we look at uh, typical properties of gas, plasma, and prep powders, what's quite traditional is 
as you move from left to right, you go, you improve sphericity, shall we say, to gas. It's probably not a fair image of a gas atomized pair there. It can be a lot better than that, but generally speaking, plasma tends to make slightly more spherical powder, and then prep powder tends to be much more spherical. If we look about the typical sizes that you make, you can start to understand why material becomes quite so expensive. So atomization, generally speaking, you don't atomize 15 to 45 microns. You atomize quite a wide range, which then you have to sieve out your fraction of interest. So if you look at gas and plasma, we can do the entire range of interest. Prep, not quite so useful from a perspective for SLM because it doesn't make that fine distribution. Uh, but you can see with the plasma, your yield is probably going to be somewhat higher because you're making a much narrower range in the first instance. Cost-wise, these are based on costs that we got last year for titanium 6.4, so 45 to 106 microns. Generally speaking, if we say that gas is the sort of the ben benchmark at one, Plasma tends to be slightly more expensive, prep substantially more expensive, closer to two times the value. So we can start to get an understanding of cost, um, benefits of the various different techniques. So if we look at the case study then, so I mentioned we had four suppliers of electron beam melted pad, so that's the, 50, the 45 to 106, titanium 6.4 procured from four different suppliers fully anonymized. <laughs> so you can see the, on, the, on the sample table there, it does say who the suppliers are, but the results are fully anonymized, so you won't be able to see who the results are. But basically, what we can start to see, we've got four suppliers here. Have I got a cursor? Because my thing doesn't work. <coughs> so supplier one and supplier three, in this scenario, make very um, spherical powder that we consider to be quite ideal for, um, for AM. And, and what we mean by that is basically the absence of all these bad examples of particles. So absence of splag caps, absence of agglomerated materials, absence of satellites. That's quite a key one for additive manufacturing. We don't want satellite particles in the, in the powder. Absence of broken particles, generally speaking, mostly spherical, which is going to give us a good, a good feeling about how these powders will flow and how they'll pack. Suppliers two and four. Not quite as good as, um, as, the, as the other two, but generally speaking, they're okay. They're acceptable. They're, they're not t too bad on the morphology side. We then look at size. Now, bear in mind, for size, we were looking for how, how close the supplier can get it to 45 to 106 micron distribution. We've got suppliers one, two, three, and four. Straight away, we can see three of those suppliers are quite good at it. You know, they're quite close together quite good distribution in the 45 to 106 fraction. Supplier 4 gives us a slightly worse distribution. There's a lot more coarse in there. So clearly, for this supplier, we're going to have to do a lot of post-processing to sieve the material down, which, of course, reduces the yield that we actually get that we want. Can't use that. Potentially, it's not going to melt well. Potentially, it's going to cause defects in the, in the parts. We then move on to look at oxygen content. So this is titanium 6.4, so clearly we are particularly interested in oxygen content. We can see three of the suppliers well within the spec limits. Well, one of the suppliers well within the spec limits, two of them acceptable. Supplier three, clearly not. So you can start to see as you go through these different techniques, some suppliers are getting in specs, some aren't. Uh, and this, of course, highlights the issue with paired testing. It's not just about testing one, one aspect. It's not just saying, well, the chemistry's right, it's there for everything else to be fine. We can start to see as you go through this, certain suppliers are hitting, cert hitting certain um, spec limits, but not others. We can then move on to flow. So this was just measured on Hall's flow. Generally speaking, there's nothing to tell the, the four materials apart. We're quite happy with how they flow. But then in terms of how they pack, remember we're looking for dense material. We can see two of the suppliers, really quite high packing density to the suppliers just around the specs limit. So straight away, you've got four suppliers, all nominally supplying the same chemistry. It's all titanium 6.4, and it was all in spec for that, apart from the one on the oxygen. Chemically, they're all the same material. But quite clearly, from a paired properties point of view, they're very different. And consequently, they're likely to perform very differently. In terms of how we then turned all of that information into a down selection, we effectively developed um, a scoring methodology where we rated each of the four materials we looked at in terms of morphology, 
particle size, conformance, oxygen content, density, where higher is better, and cost. And basically, we scored 10 being highly suitable or highly applicable for, ad for additive, one being pretty much unsuitable. And straight away, you can see you've got that one there that was well out on the oxygen, not suitable at all. Based on these results, we see that supplier two uh, was the one that scored highest, and that was the one that was selected for the purposes of taking forward a maze to make the demonstrator parts or APOD parts. The next stage of that then was to order material from the, this particular supplier and continue to assess it based on this criteria to make sure that they were consistently hitting the spec limits. Um, within the Amaze project, we did have certain grades that were sent to us not quite in the spec limit. We sent them back to the suppliers. Say it, we explained why they were at the spec limit and why we'd sent them back. They, they post-processed them in a different way, sent it back to us, they were back in spec. We, we forward it on, so it's quite a clear sort of impact of where, where the specs that we've developed have had an impact on the process and in terms of guaranteeing quality of the incoming materials. So in summary, um, within the Amaze project, we developed a, a specification that controls the critical process variables for AM paired us. Um, there was also one developed for wire as well, uh, obviously not discussed in this, in this pro presentation. We did a down selection of paired of suppliers to make sure that we could get the properties we wanted from the supply chain and that they could consistently hit those. Um, and like I said, going forward, all of the paired of submitted to Amaze to make any demonstrated part was assessed against this specification and it was not accepted unless it hit that spec. And I guess just a point there just to add is that all of the information that we developed through testing of these materials was added up onto the, uh, the Amaze database. So it's quite a rich data now on pair to supply for AM. Any questions, Any questions? for Jason about the, the methodology <laughs> and some of the results? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Do you want then? Uh, I could. Okay. Want um, you were showing the, the... If you just go one back... One back? You the, the price comparison, the cost. Mm -hmm. Is that linear? So if uh, it's number two... 30% more expensive or, uh, than, than number one? It's never quite as easy as that <laughs> I can because, so we, so you, the answer to that question, there was a certain amount of adjustments of figures, so okay. you can't directly read them across because when you ask suppliers to sieve a small amount of material, it's one price, and when you ask them to sieve a huge amount of material, you know, mm. uh, in one case, 700 kilos, a slightly different pricing structure, but it, it is all taken in. So the weighting, you don't try and read it across as, a, as an absolute precise uh, algorithm. It doesn't work that way. Okay, then I'll ask the second question, <laughs> because it would have been number one is actually very close to number it two. Is. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak about uh, where you were sampling your sample to make your characterization? Where we're sampling them. <coughs> so. Every, every um, batch of material that was brought into a maze, we would effectively have a subsample of that batch sent to us. So the supplier sent material in effectively five, there were like five pound or 10 pound drums. They would send a few of those drums to us as, as a, you know, according to AFKM standards for uh, sampling. So there's a, a recommendation on if a batch of paired comes in so many samples, you take it, a sample from each one, blend it together so you get this homogenous sort of representative sample. So we did that. Uh, effectively, of these drums we got, we would sample using ASTM standard methods, mix it together, break it down, then using spinning riffler or shoe splitter, depending on the nature of the material, um, to get a lab sample. And then if it was flow tested, that was conditioned to eliminate humidity. And then the flow testing that we did at the MTC was done within a humidity controlled environment. So we know that, you know, depending on the time of year, humidity changes, but the test environment that we exposed it to was always consistent. So we can be better sure that um, differences are inherent rather than. So you, you were testing average properties of your powder from your batch. Have you been comparing this average property to the individual property that you had in each of the canisters? It wasn't part of the study, so we were trying to make sure that what we had was a representative sample. So we followed the methodology set out by ASTM. Um, 
it would be an interesting study to understand just fact, you know, bottle to bottle, is there a difference in properties, but it wasn't part of what we were looking at. Because we know that the materials would be then mixed together and used as a mixed homogeneous batch rather than used as individual, um, individual canisters. We may have done that work for other projects. So that the question that on is that we do, we have been asked that question before and we haven't undertaken a study, but not been in the May, to see how persistent <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be the key measure? So the problem, of course, with it is that it's very component material specific. Um, so it would be hard to put a number on a general, a, gen a general number on how many times you can get away with using a pair because it will just depend on what you're making and what material you're using. Um, so, yeah. It's a good question. But it is a good, yeah. If you have a material that's right up against the limits, the top limits on oxygen, you want to think what happens next time I reuse it, it will then take it over that oxygen level. So, you know, being in specification is one thing, just making sure the oxygen is quite a long way from the top limit. Otherwise, mm. you'll regret it at some stage, and you'll have to then do a lot more work to get it back into the spec. There's another point to add there as well, and in terms of defining how many times you can use it. So, if we're already in ELI PEDA, the limits, I think it's 0.13 on, on oxygen. Clearly, if I order material at 0 0.8, 0 0.08, I can use it a lot more times than I order a material at 0 0.11. But of course, it's still in spec. I can just get less uses out of it. And that's, that's some work that we have done as well in the past where we've looked at the effect of the supply, you know, the at supply option level and how many times you can use it. Uh, we have looked at that within other projects, not within the, not within the maze. There's a couple of questions. Take, take the one. There's one at the back as well. Consistency is important. In your opinion, what do power suppliers need to do better to make sure that customers get better, more consistent power supply? Because you said yourself that I guess this was the power where you said halfway through your building processes that they something changed. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be disastrous and very costly in cases. So what, 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 do, what do power suppliers need to do better, in your opinion? That example was quite extreme in the sense that they didn't just change, the, they changed a different process. So they were, were originally getting material from one supplier, it completely changed their supply route, and, and that new supplier had a different process as well. So it wasn't even a like for like, it was a different supply and a different optimization technique. And that was what that was so quite that's extreme. Right. So and we didn't have it in the time specification, yeah. so almost they get away with it. Now we've developed tighter specifications, that would be mm. picked up immediately sooner and ideally by the supplier. But we were at that time working with specifications that were developed for powder metallurgy processes like powder hips, and they didn't really specify the conditions accurately. So we're, we're learning. <coughs> What they always say is that one of our frustrations with this exercise is although we sent to the suppliers the specification we wanted, some of them we clearly hadn't followed it. And because they've been used to supplying powder to people who wouldn't test the powder, they've been able to do that. So when we first put the powder test lab in, in the first month we sent, sent back about 60,000 euros of material. And that material wasn't scrapped, that went to somebody else. <laughs> So if you don't have your powder test lab, you're going to be accepting somebody else's waste. So be very, very careful. And, that, and I think it's a process we have to work with suppliers. We understand they've got to make the business. In the room, who is the powder supplier? <laughs> the, the guy behind you. So you're from? Okay, so yeah, I do know the company. Yeah. So ultimately, it's about working with suppliers in partnership and saying, look, these are the things that are really important to this process. We're not being, you know, if we're making a part that's taking 100 hours to process at 1,000 euros an hour, that's an, we don't want defects in it. We've got to make sure it's, 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 it's as good as we can make it. And actually, 
that may mean paying a bit more money for the material, so as long as we get the material that's free from, from defect. Okay, so <clears throat> the material was stored in the supplier's packaging, so it wasn't taken out prior to testing, uh, it was kept within the packaging, it was kept within a humidity controlled environment, was not stored under argon or anything like that. Um, when we did the chemistry test, it was the first thing we did, we, we opened the packaging, we take the samples that we need for chemistry and we immediately test that. So exposure to atmosphere is reasonably limited, but again, it's not controlled under argon, the handling process. Um, in answer to the first question, did we go back to the supplier? It's, it's, it wasn't something we did, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, perhaps I should have done, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're, as a process follows, we follow the specification, and the opening specification is yeah. very clear. responsibility of the uh, times uh, after that. So within the EBM, I believe they can be stored under wick, aren't they? Where they're stored in there under our, yeah. under vacuum? Yeah, we, and we, with, 
we have respect to long, long term storage. If mm. we go on the tour, we'll show you the containers. I'm trying to leave the witness here. And in fact, we do, we have bought a lot of vacuum containers. Yeah. I remember signing the order off. And that's where the material should be. On laser melting, they're generally held under argon. Or under argon, yeah. under argon. No, no, they're, they're stored in uh, stored in containers. We have got some containers now which have increased capability in the sense they can s they measure the s conditions that they're being stored under. So they measure the oxygen content that's exposed to. They measure the humidity. So yeah, we've got smart packaging, shall we say, that knows where it, how it's been exposed, but no, it's not held under argon. No. No. Why would you be using argon rather than nitrogen? Either, either or. It depends on the material. But I suppose what I'm saying is, what we've noticed in the early days, that the packaging was how the supply mm. bit wasn't suitable for the job. Now most of us had to get turned around quickly. So if you've had a, a package of powder on your on your shop floor for six months, and it may well have been six months on in, in their store, if the, if the packaging isn't up to the job, it will be absorbing mm. moisture. And we have to have more rigorous methods of storing the powder. To be fair, some of the powder suppliers now are, are onto this and are providing the powder in a different form. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got quite a few. That was good. Speaking of things changing, Howard, I just said powder supplier, you've done a lot of work in terms of characterization, similar to what you've done here. space has got to be controlled and the controls will be derived by the manufacturing process and the trials and errors that you'll find along the way. We're already finding ourselves that there are better forms of powder production which will give you a more clean product where that's critical in aerospace, where it's not so critical for a commercial application. And I think at the moment, as far as we can see, the AM industry, generally speaking, <coughs> and the machine builders are buying their own stack regardless of application. So I think as the applications become more critical, the powder specifications become more and more um, stricter in terms of controls, including oxygen content, PSD, and all the rest of the packaging. Most people make more confidence in the process, but it's quite a challenge just to manage the material at one level. Once you then have different grades of material, it then becomes another layer, layer of complexity. I do know that the bureaus, the service bureaus, do have that Methodology, particularly because they need to get rid of some of the, their older material. So if you're making bicycle belts, you don't necessarily worry so much about, about the mechanical property. So you can accept a different type of powder. So we, we, we're, we're, at, we're, at, we're at the start of a journey at the moment. It's, it's, the solutions are not particularly sophisticated because we, we, are, we don't have the confidence. We want to get more confidence with more sophisticated. I'm going to suggest that if anyone needs to have a, a short comfort break, we've managed to make a little bit of time up, but I'm trusting you to do all